Good morning and welcome to Burrow Lake Park. Also, welcome to the River New Kent online experience. My name is Brian and I'm so glad to be in this setting in Lower Burrow, in this great park, this little gem in Lower Burrow, and uh, with the pond behind us, it is a great setting. A great setting where you can find some rest and some relaxation. As a kid, I came here oftentimes, many times. I remember when I was allowed to fish, when my dad would let me take his pole and come here fishing, the one time, well, the last time he did is the reason why is across the the pond there there's a tree and a blue bench over there and I was sitting there and I casted it out and I set it down on a little on a little wide twig that you make to hold it there and I never released a bell of the, the reel I never released it and so I just left it there and I sat down and next thing I know a fish took the line and the pole went flying out in the middle of the lake Never saw that swim pool again. That fishing pool is probably still in there somewhere. And I think that was the last time my dad ever allowed me to use any of his fishing equipment or even go fishing at all. It was I was not a great fisherman, but I remember that story at this park. And because parks are great, I encourage you to get out into a park, find some rest, find a way to pull yourself aside and connect with God in a beautiful nature setting like this. Welcome to church. My name is Brian. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over, my story's just begun Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does No failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final, when the father's in the room. No failure's never final, when the father's in the room. Prodigals come home The helpless find hope Love is on the move When the father's in the room A prison doors fling wide The dead come to life Love is on the move When the father's in the room Miracles take place The cynical find faith Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Oh, Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. No, oh, love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens 
in Mark 1, verse 35, it says, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. And uh, I'll get to that on me in a second here. But I want to tell you about just trying to stay awake, trying to keep going, trying to keep pushing ourselves further and further to not take a break, to not rest. When I was uh, in eighth grade, we were flying over to Germany. And uh, because of the time difference, my mother and father told me, try to stay up, try not to rest. So when you get there, you can go right to sleep because just how it was going to work out. We were going to get there at night. And when we left, it was morning. And so they just wanted me to stay up so I could go to sleep as soon as I got there. So I tried. I made it through the first flight. And the second flight, we got to England and I was still awake, barely awake. And then uh, we had to take an England, a flight from England to Germany. And I remember sitting on the tarmac and it was about to take off and it took off. And then they were bringing around some food, dinner or something. I can't remember what. And I remember I must have put my head down on the tray table and I fell asleep. And uh, my brother was there beside me, my mother and the father a couple rows back and uh, they kind of told Chad to wake me up so I could eat they didn't want me to miss a meal and uh, so my brother kept trying to wake me and he I wouldn't wake up I was dead asleep and so he shook me real hard and all I was told is I jumped up out of my seat almost and just started screaming at him yelling at him in the middle of this packed plane that why would he wake me up what was he doing and I just looked around I saw the embarrassment on my parents face as they ducked down in their seats and everybody just looking shocked at this kid who's screaming on a plane what was I doing I was pushing myself trying to stay awake that sooner or later that all caught up to me and then everything just went apart that's kind of what in our life when we keep pushing ourselves so hard and not in just with work and not with just uh it's with everything we do so many family activities and we try to get out and we're, we're golf or a church and lots of church church activities and we keep just piling things over top of the even though they're all good things if we continue to just pow and pow and never take the time to rest all of a sudden everything you're going to find yourself screaming in an airplane I don't know. I, I found myself there. But what Jesus even practiced this. He had a busy schedule. He had things he had to do. He had a mission to do. But he took time in the early morning to go out and spend time alone with his father. And he's encouraging us to do the same thing. Set some time aside in your schedule to pull away, to spend time talking to God, and getting rejuvenated, getting that rest that we all need. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for setting the example. Lord, and I know your schedule was extremely busy, Lord, but you always felt found time to go and talk to your Father, Lord. Encourage us to do the same thing, Lord. Help us to find the time, not just help us to find, help us to, to, desperately, to, to set aside the time, to make that choice and talk to you, Lord. Give us the ability to do that this week, Lord, and to continue to put it into our lives, Lord. I ask that you quiet all those voices that are telling us, no, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go, we got to accomplish things. Quiet those voices. Let us hear your voice that says, rest, take time, and rest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
be still and know that the Lord is in control. Be still, my soul. Stand and watch his giants fall. I won't be afraid, cause you are here. You silence all my fears. I won't be afraid. You don't let Be still and trust what the Lord has said is done. Find rest, don't strive. Watch his faith and grace align. I won't be afraid, cause you are. You silence all my fears I won't be afraid You don't let go Be still my heart and know I won't be afraid Surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Surely Lord, I won't be afraid, cause you are here, you silence all my fears, I won't be afraid, you don't let go, be still my heart and know, I won't be afraid. Surely love and mercy. Surely love and mercy. Your peace and kindness will follow me. Will follow me. Surely love and mercy. Your peace and kindness will follow me. Will follow me. One more time, let's sing. I won't be afraid. Give him your fears this morning. I won't be afraid Cause you are here You silence all my fears I won't be afraid You don't let go Be still my heart and
Well, good morning. My name is Dean Ward, and I'm the lead pastor of the River Church, and I am so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us here this morning. I want to welcome uh, both of our campuses, the River New Kensington and the River Franklin Park, to this service this morning and to this message. And I want to invite uh, everyone watching just to take a moment and share this on whatever social media platform that you're watching it on today. Now, uh, a friend just asked me about how that works, and I had explained to him that you go to the River New Ken YouTube, and all the videos are there. You can copy the link, text it, email it, you can send it that way. Um, at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, we post the sermon on Facebook. You can uh, share it there. And at 8 a.m., we have our live interactive worship service online that we invite you to join in with us. It's pre-recorded, but uh, I'm on it and we are able to interact. So I want to invite you to join in with that. Now, you may be saying, Dean, I'm, I'm just so confused, first of all. Um, what, what are you doing? Um, well, I wanted to share with you a few of my Father's Day gifts before we got started. Um, Father's Day, the way Father's Day gifts work at my house is they ask me what I want, I tell them, and then they get them. Uh, or I see what I'd like, and I buy it and then bring it home and tell them, I want you to give this to me for Father's Day. So my second daughter, who has a big job now, uh, she reached out to me and said, Dad, what do you want for Father's Day? And I just ran across these Andy's Secret uh, Keto Granola Packs that I have fallen in love with, and they're hard to find. Well, she went on Amazon and bought me three. I asked for four, but she bought me three packs of these, and I am so excited. Uh, I like them to crunch on. I can also pour milk over them, have them like cereal. Uh, they help make my Father's Day great. Uh, secondly, um, I was somewhere this spring, and I went into a sporting goods store and saw this jacket. And I thought, man, I would love to own that Carhartt jacket. It was like really on sale. Uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, I, I just loved it. So I put it on, it fit perfect, and so I bought it, and to justify it, I came home and gave it to my wife and said, you can give this to me on Father's Day. She forgot all about it. We're having dinner on Father's Day Sunday. They gave me a couple gifts, and I'm like, well, where's my big gift from you, Leslie? And she's like, what? And then she went and got it, wrapped it, and so this is its maiden voyage to be worn, except I did try it on Sunday, and ever since Sunday, I've been missing my keys, and I just reached in my pocket, and I found my keys. So got great pockets so grateful for this but I have to tell you my all-time favorite Father's Day gift just came delivered to the house this afternoon we're filming Thursday afternoon and I had to share it with you now I went to a grad party and a principal at the school uh, was wearing this t-shirt of the greatest motivational speaker of all time and I said Man, if I could only have that as a Father's Day gift, and my kids came through, and I'm very grateful. So, uh, that's. I hope your Father's Day last week was great. Uh, mine was. Had a great day with my family and kids, and it was fantastic. So, um, I'm filming today at Burl Lake Park, and I wanted to film in front of this guy because uh, parks have a way of taking us back to when life was just a little bit slower a little bit calmer, made a little bit more sense, back to the good old days. And my very first trip to the Pittsburgh Zoo, uh, I have a photograph of this, it may be the exact one, I don't know, or one close to it, uh, taking a drink out of the water fountain of this lion's mouth. And uh, just to take me back, I want to experience that now too. Mmm. How refreshing. Warm park water that's been sitting in there all winter. I'm so grateful that I got to enjoy that together with you. So, um, I hope you had a fa great Father's Day, as I mentioned. Um, but we are in part four of our series of messages, just simply called Thriving. And we're asking the question, what makes a good life? We are invited to live a thriving life in Jesus Christ and as followers of him. But so often, we miss the mark. We fall short. So for this sermon series during the summer, 
we're, we're breaking down and looking at some components of life that make life good. And uh, sometimes they're overlooked components of living and following, of Christ, following Christ. And that's where we find ourselves today as well. Because today, what makes a good life, what makes a thriving life, we are going to look at the goodness of Sabbath and rest. Now, there's a great passage of Scripture. It's just two verses that Jesus spoke, and I'm so glad he said these words. I'm so grateful that these words are included in the Bible, in the Gospels, and they are from him because I want to believe these words are true. I want to hold on to these words. I want to follow these words because as we do, we will thrive. You ready? One of the most comforting passages in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Jesus is speaking and he simply says, Come to me, all you who are weary and and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, is there anyone here whose souls could use a little bit more rest? I'm not talking just a 20-minute cap nap to get enough energy to make it through the day. I'm talking about rest for your souls. Well, Jesus tells us that we can live with rest for our souls when we come to him, when we rest in him. John Mark Comer, one of my favorite authors, wrote a book that is profound It's just simply called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he states that we ought to live our lives ruthlessly eliminating hurry in all of its forms from our lives. Corey Ten Boom, the famous uh, survivor of concentration camp, and the Holocaust, she wrote a book, and and she has this quote. She goes, if the devil can't make you sin, then he'll make you busy. (laughs) Uh, But in our culture, busyness is valued. Uh, Busyness, you get a star. Like, you get one of those Stargill stars from the late 70s on your baseball cap of life if you live busy. The number of people that come up to me and say, Pastor Dean, I know you've been really busy. I know you're busy. Busy, 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 busy. And they say it like it's a badge of honor. Like, my goal is to be just busy and busy and busy. Both sin and busyness have the exact same effects on our lives. Both sin and busyness cut off our connection to God to other people, and even to our own soul. Carl Jung says, hurry is not of the devil. (laughs) Hurry is the devil. The number one problem we face is time. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives. Now, there's a healthy kind of busyness when your life is full of things that matter, not wasted on empty leisure or trivial pursuits. The problem is not when you have a lot to do. It's when you have too much to do, and the only way to keep up the quotient is to hurry. That kind of busy is what has us all reeling. Well, in John Mark Comer's book, The Ruthless, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he outlines four practical steps, four practices of unhurrying our lives. 
And for the rest of our message this morning, I would like to just look at all four of those, four practices of unhurrying our lives. The first one is just simply silence and solitude. The practice of silence and solitude is uncomfortable for us. I was reminded this morning how uncomfortable we are with silence. Uh, The gym that I go to, the owner of the gym is young and he loves young people's music. And every day when we come in, he has that music playing 24 seven in the gym. And 6.30 a.m. is a little early for me for the loud uh, rap and rock music he loves to play to get us hyped and going. Uh, And this morning, because of the storm that came through Wednesday night, the speaker got knocked out and it was so refreshing for me to work out in a gym in silence. It was so replenishing for me to work out where there was no music, just blasting, blaring. It was so replenishing, refreshing to do that in silence until halfway through and then he figured out on his Roku stick he could play the YouTube channel and play the music he wanted. So we did finally get music, but it was so unnerving to others that, wait, there's no music, I can't work out, I don't know how to do this. And sometimes we live our lives, like if we don't have all the noise going, if we don't have all the busy hurriedness going, if we're, if we're not going at Mach 5, uh, we, we, just can't, we just can't handle it. Well, we are invited to live lives that experience silence and solitude. I love this verse the psalmist gives us in Psalm 46, verse 10, when God is speaking and it says, he says, be still and know that I am God. It is hard to remember that God is God and we are not God whenever we're so busy. But when we're still before him, we are reminded that he is God. Andrew Sullivan says, there are books to be read, landscapes to be walked, friends to be with, life to be fully lived. This new epidemic of distraction is our civilization's specific weakness. And its its threat is not so much our minds, even as they shape shift under the pressure, the threat is to our souls. At this rate, if the noise does not relent, we might even forget that we have any soul, that is. The noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we need most. Ronald Rothsizer says, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. Now, Brian shared with you how Jesus took great care to withdraw, to pull himself away, to experience solitude, to experience silence, to be still before his Father. And this is the invitation that we see throughout the Gospels. Jesus still pulling himself away, experiencing silence and solitude because that is where he found his strength in the Father, with the Father, abiding in the Father. And to do that optimally, he pulled away day after day and experienced silence and solitude. How are you doing in your life? Do you have silence and solitude built into the rhythm of your life? I want to share this video with you just simply called, I Am God. And it's a little loud and busy at the beginning, but I want you to experience the silence that comes in this video.
Let's enjoy this video together. to boost its interest rates up to 18% as it battles against financial collapse. The move is designed to stabilize the And now, economic messages to win the support of undecided voters. Well, if you're anything like me, I, I'm guessing that the silence halfway through that video became very loud. And that's one of the things that happens when we take time for solitude and silence. It's a little unnerving. It's a little uneasy. It, it, it creates a little disturbance in us that, that it's like, wait, wait, I'm not used to this. What is this? But it's the place that God can speak when we are still and silent before him. Uh, the second practice, the second practice that helps bring unhurry to our life is Sabbath, is Sabbath. Now, I have to confess, I, I am um, from a background that some of the people that I sat under their teaching emphatically made it clear that the Sabbath was an Old Testament principle that God taught for his people at that time and that Jesus never restated or commanded Sabbath. And so Sabbath was always kind of devalued. And I, I have to admit, um, I'm, I'm beginning to explore what part Sabbath might have in my life. And if you Sabbath regularly, man, I would love to converse with you and to see how that works out, how that plays out, how that help, uh, works in your life. Because in John Mark Comer's book, he makes such a compelling case for how you and I are created to Sabbath. So let's just look at some of the scriptural, scriptural foundation for Sabbath. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, By the seventh day God had finished the work he'd been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, it's fascinating to know how God created and how we are made in his image and we are made as creative beings. But there's something 
that happens when we just create and create and create and produce and produce and produce and we don't Sabbath. It erodes our souls. This statement, this command is restated, is given to us, not restated, it's given to us by Moses in the Ten Commandments. Now, if you were to break down the Ten Commandments and the proportionate amount of time they were given each in Scripture in, when they're given, it wouldn't be 10% each. This command, the fourth command to Sabbath, takes up 30% of the words used and given by God calling his people to Sabbath. He commanded and said, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter. Verse 11 continues, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. And yes, Jesus did say something about the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, when he violated what the rule keepers of that day were saying, he broke the Sabbath, he reminded them. It says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And we have Jesus' words saying to us, the Sabbath is good for our souls. The Sabbath is helpful for our lives. There was an interesting study done that the, the religious organization that guards the Sabbath vehemently, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, <laughs> that they literally live 10% longer than other religious people. And I thought that was fascinating. The Sabbath is a good thing. And I'm going to be reading more and learning more. And I want to begin practicing this because I need the Sabbath for my soul. A third practice of unhurrying our life is just the practice of simplicity. And for those of us that like to collect things and collect stuff, uh, this is a very hard to work through. And when I tell you that often I'm preaching my sermons to myself, uh, this is the case. When Leslie and I first got married, it was all about accumulating things, it felt like. And then about three years in, Leslie's like, we, we don't need to accumulate. I want to simplify my life. I want to simplify things. And when we took steps to simplify our lives, we experience thriving in ways that we had not before. We have some verses that help encourage us to simplify. After I wipe my brow, <laughs> I'm standing here in the direct sunlight, and I said to Matt, I said, is it okay if I put my towel down on the slide? Is it going to be distracting? And he said, Dean, your towel is in every sermon that we ever film. It's an old friend. Put it where you want to put it. So there you go. Luke 12, 15 says, Then he said to them, Jesus is teaching, Watch out. Be on your guard. guard. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Mark 4, 19 Jesus is teaching and he cautions us. He says, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And then Paul to Timothy, in instructing him how to teach as a minister, says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. A 
could you use a little more simplicity in your life? I want to invite you to, to unhurry your life through practicing simplicity. And finally, I want to invite you to engage in the practice of slowing. You're like, well, what, what is that, Dean? Well, it's, it's an invitation to just intentionally slow down. It's an invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good, to live life at a pace much slower than we usually live our lives. And I want to end with just a few tips on how you can slow, on how you can live a slowing life. These are 10 tips on living slowly. There's many more. These were the ones that grabbed me. And Pastor Brian does this one magnificently. You ready? Number one, drive the speed limit. What a novel idea, huh? Actually driving intentionally the, the speed that we are uh, compelled to not go over by law. Brian lives this way, and I'm going to practice it. I'm going to try it out because I'm going to practice living slower. Now, this one I do from time to time just for fun, just to see how it feels in my soul. Number two, get in the slow lane. <laughs> Get in the slow lane. Yeah, contrary to what Mike Lang would say at the Penguin Games, get in the fast lane, Grandma, you know, or whatever he would say. Have you ever just intentionally gotten in the slow lane and just driven slowly? The speed limit, of course. The third thing I want to invite you to do, and we teach all of our 16-year-old children to do this, but somehow as adults we forget, and that's when we come to a stop sign, come to a complete stop. Try that out for size. And while you're at it, if somebody else comes up shortly after you have stopped, wave them on through first. Try that on for size. See how that feels. Another step for another tip for living slowly. Uh, don't text and drive. I shouldn't have to say it, uh, but we have to be reminded. <laughs> uh, here's one. Show up 10 minutes early for an appointment and just wait. Or how about this, show up on time for your doctor's appointment and while you're waiting for the 45 minutes to be seen, in, use that as an invitation to pray, to reflect, to be silent and still before the Lord. Uh, here's one that I do from time to time. It drives me crazy, but it's helpful. Choose to get in the longest checkout line at whatever store you're checking out of. Just try it out, just try it out. It will disengage you and cause you to experience life at a slower pace for a 15 minute period of time. It's a good social experiment. It will be good for your soul. Yes, it will, Matt. He is nodding ferociously. That's a horrible idea. <laughs> visit slowly. Uh, my father-in-law, he loves to visit slowly. And I have noticed that I'm always in a hurry when I'm with him. And my commitment is that I'm going to slow down and I'm going to visit with him slowly. Uh, my wife has been doing this this summer, taking her parents on these field trips and excursions. And she took them somewhere yesterday. They had such a surprisingly amazing time. They had such a surprise at a place they went and what they got to do when she was dropping her father off at the end of the day, he said, I can't wait to go in and call my brother and tell him what I did today. Because my wife, this summer as a school teacher, has chosen to spend it with her parents, to invest the time with them, and to not be in a hurry. Uh, number eight, take a regular day alone for silence and solitude. When's the last time you've done that? Now, women, I just want to help you understand. Now, many of you may hunt as well, so I'm not trying to be sexist here. But when you wonder why guys love getting in the woods, going out in the woods, or going fishing, or going hunting, it, it is not to get away from you. Okay, That is not why we crave it. 
We cr- okay, well, maybe a little, but no, I'm just kidding. But we crave it because our souls are designed for solitude and silence. When we take time and go into the woods, we experience solitude and silence in ways that we can't throughout our week. I want to invite you, number nine, to experiment with journaling. Experiment with journaling. Now, my handwriting is indecipherable. And so I experienced with vlogging over the pandemic and every day got up and just, it it felt like journaling to my soul. My daylight with Dean time was just a verbal way of journaling and and, and logging and chronicling my life and my days during the pandemic. And finally, cook your own food and eat in. (laughs) Try that on for size. Now, I give you these 10 not because they're in Scripture or they're biblical, they'll make you more godly, but they will help your soul live a little bit slower. So will you engage with me in experiencing the goodness of Sabbath and rest? Our souls were made for it. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you for joining in with us here this morning.